The views expressed on this episode, as with all episodes of Sounds Like a Cult, are solely host opinions and quoted allegations. The content here should not be taken as indisputable facts. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Remember before we started recording, we were asking what's creepier when an adult calls their parent mommy or daddy? Yeah, (laughs) and both to me are creepy. (laughs) I know, it's kind of a tie. I was like, well, daddy's creepy, of course, because it feels vaguely sexual, but mommy is creepy because it feels so desperate. Yeah, mommy is like out of a horror movie. but... But do you know anyone who actually sincerely calls their parent mommy or daddy? I don't. No, I do have a feeling I dated a guy who like called his mom mommy and that might have been my Ew. gay ex from college. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the, the signs were there. <laughs> the signs were there. And I was thinking about the one person that I know who calls her dad daddy and she pulls it off because she says it in sort of like a half British way. Yeah, like a posh and rich. Yeah, posh and rich because wealth ultimately does infantilize you yeah that's such a good point because you are taken care of your whole life and you always will be i want to be a baby (laughs) i'm a baby i love chicken nuggets (laughs) i was just thinking like how nice would it be to be like an infant in the cradle of america i think that's like the feeling i like will always aspire for for the rest of my life (laughs) This is Sounds Like a Cult, a show about the modern-day cults we all follow. I'm Amanda Montell, author of the book Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism. I'm Issa Medina, and I'm a comedian touring all over the country. Every week on our show, we discuss a different fanatical group from the cultural zeitgeist, from Swifties to spiritual influencers, to try and answer the big question. This group sounds like a cult, but is it really? This is our episode on the cult of momfluencers. Oh my gosh, which actually goes perfectly because we're talking about being podcast mommies. Yeah. Are we momfluencers? We are literally momfluencers. Our (laughs) listeners are our daughters. And even our male listeners are our daughters because like... Because it's a cult and we need conformity. Maybe that's what we can start calling people. Instead of culties, it's daughters. daughters. I love that. Yeah. The daughters of Sounds Like a Cult. We'll figure out how to merchandise that. Great. Glad we had this discussion. That's fun, but also like someone take care of us, you know? (laughs) Yeah, but take care of us. That is classic toxic parent-child dynamic. It's where, like, you're my daughter, but actually take care of me. Yes, exactly. (laughs) But yeah, we are going to be talking about the cult of momfluencers. If you don't know, momfluencers are social media figures who grow a following. They are mothers. They give advice on parenting. They share highly curated aspirational versions of their lives, featuring their kids extensively in their content. They review and give away products. There are also a lot of celebrity mom influencers like the Kardashians or Busy Phillips. Who's your favorite one, Amanda? (laughs) <laughs> or most favorite. notorious my favorite okay well my favorite mom influencer is you just kidding. <gasps> it's probably our, our guest who we'll be talking to a little bit later today who critiques mom influencer culture her name is sarah peterson so stick around for that but actually when i was in my intense youtube consumption days back when i was in the cult of veganism i did follow a sort of new agey woo woo hippie vegan mom influencer who lived in hawaii raised all of her children on papaya and pataya she was exhibiting all the signs of like a problematic anti-vaxxer but it was 2016 2015 and i didn't know to be on the lookout for those red flags yet you showed me her instagram it is Oh, Lord, it is the vision of fake perfection. I know, I know. It it feels very passe now, that sort of overly perfect islandy influencer aesthetic, but she fucking, like, gave birth to all of her children with no medication in a freaking marble bathtub on her front porch in Hawaii and, like, had an orgasm ostensibly every time she gave birth. <laughs> that re- that makes me think of, like, what Gen Z will be like when they have kids because millennials were definitely like, oh, life is perfect, add a filter, add a filter. But Gen Z is going to do, like, blurry photo dumps of their baby's shits. You know what I mean? <laughs> if they it's- even have children because Gen Z is so hopeless, they're just like, I can't do that to the next generation. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's this comedian, Ariel Elias. She just made her late night debut and she has a really funny joke. She's like, millennials say, oh, I don't want to have kids because 
there's so much suffering in this world. And then she's like, but I believe that children should suffer, <laughs> which is so funny. So, I mean, momfluencers are famously problematic, good looking, aspirational. <laughs> but what really like makes them the perfect cult leader, do you think? Well, I think momfluencers have become such a robust cultish category in our culture right now because of essentially how vulnerable modern motherhood makes you. It's so lonely. It's so difficult. There are so many reasons to feel bad about your skills as a mother. I mean, just think about the ways that motherhood is talked about from the very start. Like if you get pregnant after the age of 35, you're termed a geriatric mother. If your uterus has some sort of issue, it's labeled an inhospitable womb. I mean, these are such emotionally charged shapes shame ridden terms. Yeah. And when you have a baby, you're supposed to be so happy, but postpartum mm. depression is so common. Kylie Jenner was saying it like this. She was like, oh, I just have the post baby blues. And I'm like, girly, you have postpartum depression. It's like the last animal experience that we have in this like technologically ruled society. Everything is so digitized and automated and optimized, except for pregnancy. Think of like these kids who grew up on their phones who are like, hmm, yeah, maybe I do want to be a mother. All of a sudden they're growing a fucking marsupial in their bodies and they're just like, yeah. wait, I'm alive? I'm not so a cyborg? True. <laughs> it's like one of the last human experiences left that there's like no shortcut around if you actually like want to birth the child yourself, you know? So totally. that's that's crazy. That's so It is very shocking. About. And it is still very dangerous. We're trying to like overly cutesify it and gloss over the like gruesome reality that is pregnancy and childbirth and motherhood. Like it has historically been a painful, rewarding survival based enterprise that now we're turning into this like pristine, yeah. sterile marketing moment. I myself do hope to be a mother one day if I'm able to. And even though that still feels pretty far away, I feel like I've been preconditioned my whole life to harbor guilt about being, you know, an old mom or some kind of imperfect mom and thus a failure as a woman overall, you know? I completely agree. I mean, I have always just assumed I was going to have children. And so like now I'm just coming to terms with the fact that I'm like, I don't know if I want to have kids. I do want to have a like relationship like that, but I don't, I don't know, you know? Let's talk a little bit about the history of the momfluencer landscape and how it became so culty. Before the social media influencer craze, there was a really big mommy blogger culture. Between 2005, 2010 was the first wave of mommy bloggers. They started writing confessional, raw accounts of their experiences. It was the time period like when Ray Dunn came out, really. It was that time <laughs> period of when women were like allowed to be imperfect and it was cute and groundbreaking. And the pioneers in the arena included Heather Armstrong and Catherine Connors. There's a quote from the New York Times that said Armstrong became renowned for turning the struggles of family life into an intimate form of comedy. So just this idea that like motherhood was a form of entertainment really? A form of entertainment, but also a form of solace. I mean, this is the beautiful part of it, right? The internet allowed mothers to connect with one another, to swap war tales, to commiserate, to advise one another so that they wouldn't feel so alone because early parenthood is famously isolating. I mean, you're just at home alone with a tiny screaming infant you're like basically stranded on a deserted island and before the internet I mean sure you had books written by authority figures and maybe you had other mothers in the neighborhood but you probably also felt quite competitive with the other mothers in the neighborhood like who's the sort of super mom in in yeah. the group and it makes sense that a lot of the times war stories weren't exchanged because in order to commiserate you had to like get ready get dressed look nice leave your house and meet your <laughs> friends out at brunch portray this idea of yourselves that was like perfect put together and so you weren't going to say the worst part of your day but when you're in front of a screen in your pajamas with like a little baby vom on your shirt you know <laughs> you're gonna have your guard down and you're gonna be able to like tell those darker stories and exchange those truths 
For sure. Yeah, that's the sort of wholesome part of the mommy blogger origin story. But then around 2010 with Web 2.0, momfluencer content began to shift to be more aspirational. And that's in part because websites and platforms were able to host pictures and videos in really high quality. And so your visuals had to be perfect. They had to be gorgeous in order to get people to read your posts. Yeah, that's when the influencer vibe kind of started coming in. A lot of those pictures are similar to the perfect pictures that you see in my child was just born photos. People literally hire professional photographers for these moments. And there's something so crazy about that because just take the picture of the baby on your iPhone. Like it's very good quality. (laughs) <laughs> almost too good of quality like don't actually don't take a picture of your freshly born baby on your iPhone they should hand out like disposable cameras <laughs> in like the birthing unit take away phones and yeah. give disposable cameras <laughs> so that the pictures are a little blurry like back in the day and they're not so high def with the like gooey baby that does remind me of how like some people will literally face tune themselves and their children in the birthing room right after so they like creepy. squeezed a human being out of the birth canal and like everybody looks perfect and it's like this is deranged but the advent of social media made it possible for anybody to become a small-scale celebrity of sorts the problem there is that your babies and your children are in endemic to your brand yeah they are your product yes exactly so that's extremely dehumanizing and really sketchy consent wise because of the phenomenon of sharenting which is a portmanteau of share and parenting share s-h-a-r-e not (laughs) (laughs) c-h-e-r i will survive anyways you share photos of your children without them explicitly being able to verbalize whether or not that's okay and that can put them in an extremely vulnerable situation psychologically where not only are there identifying details, public information, but also they've been branded since birth. I think most babies like look the same right (laughs) when they're born to like maybe six, seven months. So I think it's really funny when moms put stickers on the faces of their babies and then when their baby becomes a toddler and is actually forming into like a real human, they take the sticker off. I'm like, this is when they're going to start to be recognizable. Like maybe (laughs) add the sticker later when it's a real person and not when it's still baking. Oh, oh, oh my God. So that relates to how zealous the momfluencer's followers can get. I just heard a story of this TikTok momfluencer who decided to stop sharing images of her baby's face for whatever reason. And the followers flipped the fuck out because they got so parasocially attached to this stranger's baby that they were like, why did you take my baby away from me? Oh my gosh. (laughs) It's also worth noting that this wave of aspirational momfluencers included a lot of religious mothers too, especially Mormon moms, and we'll talk about that more with our guests. But I do feel like there is a uh, Mormon momfluencer filter that you like spot from a mile away. Do you know what it looks like? Yeah, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. (laughs) It's just like shiny and white and bright. Very blown out, very high exposure. Um, There's also an evangelical momfluencer filter, though, and that one is kind of like washed out, almost washed out. Mm -hmm. It definitely is a vibe. (laughs) I mean, it's a whole vibe. Do I like it? I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. So momfluencers, they can be fun, they can be flirty, but let's talk about the (laughs) darker aspects of why they're so culty. Well, it can't be denied that over the past few years, momfluencer culture and multi-level marketing culture and the anti-vax community have really coalesced. There are so many momfluencers obviously concerned about the health of their children who internalize and then disseminate en masse really troubling anti-science rhetoric, anti-mask rhetoric, anti-sunscreen rhetoric. And they do it in a way that's ultra palatable. It doesn't look conspiratorial. It's all in like beautiful fonts and millennial pink colors. But they're spreading a QAnon type message saying, you know, we should have freedom over fear and the solution is you. They encourage 
their followers to teach their bodies to heal themselves, chemical and toxic freedom, balance your vibrations. And it's a red flag that they are starting to be more preoccupied with brand deals and at the same time, shame and judgment, sending these messages while reeling in money and reeling in new followers. Absolutely. I think one of the most cultish and problematic things about many momfluencers is their eagerness to establish themselves as authority figures on every subject under the sun, from parenting to nutrition to mental health to physics. And meanwhile, they are flattening these really complex subjects such that they can capitalize them by upselling their followers on a product or a course or an essential oil kit. Yeah. And that cultishness really exploded during the pandemic. Yeah. And now that you mention it, something that scares me a little bit about that is that we only see what they're posting on like their public Instagram. I cannot imagine how many people are in these momfluencers DMs. And it kind of scares me to think about the kind of advice they're giving behind closed doors. I mean, who knows if they even practice what they preach, right? That's the whole deception of momfluencer culture is that they are selling you this image that they are a super aspirational mother who lives on a farm and has six vegan children and no one ever gets sick because they use this perfect tincture that they created in-house. And here you can come to the retreat and learn how to do it yourself. But behind the scenes, who knows? They could be feeding their kids Taco Bell and yeah. – like whenever one of them actually does get sick, they're definitely whisking them off to the hospital. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of in high school when like everyone tried to play down how much they studied for a test. And I was the idiot who fell for it. I was like, oh, have you guys started studying for this? And they were like, no, it's such an easy test. Like I'm, I'm <laughs> barely even gonna, I'm just gonna like look over my notes from class. And then the next day I would be like, okay, that's what I'm gonna do too. And then we'd come in for the test and they would turn it in in five seconds and pull out all their note cards, like super over prepared. And I was like, wait, I thought we were just gonna look at our notes from the homework okay and I think there's a lot at play there I think people are overly competitive and there's this idea that like if you get an A on the test I can't get an A yes. on the test which is sort of true when you're grading on a curve yeah. <laughs> but also I I think there is a shame in really 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 trying yeah but what I'm saying is that like I was the one who fell for the facade mm. the same way that these momfluencers are like oh being a mom is easy Easy. Like yes. it's not that hard. I barely looked at my notes and I got through it. Meanwhile, they are taking their kids to the doctor, yes. but they're making it look like it was so easy. And I could easily be that person who thinks like, oh, maybe having a kid isn't that hard. I just need to like look over my homework and then have a baby tomorrow, you know? <laughs> the homework being that momfluencer's account, that momfluencer's exactly. MLM downline, that exactly. momfluencer's little starter pack that they're selling in the link in their bio. But the yeah. damage that momfluencer culture is having on society at large has been described by people with actual formal accreditations in mental health. There's a board certified pediatrician named Dr. Mona Amin who told in the know.com that momfluencer culture is having a negative impact on maternal mental health. She said when you follow momfluencers you begin to think of this person as your friend largely because they are allowing you into their life. They share mostly the good stuff and you can be left feeling that your life is so hard or wonder why your child doesn't behave like this friend's child. Yeah, and that makes sense that there's more harmful advice out there because before social media, parenting advice was limited to parenting books and yeah. occasional TV spots. And so there was a lot more of a threshold of like, oh, this needs to be fact-checked or this needs to be a more formal experience. And as much as that's good for social media to like give rise to voices who have previously been – like, locked out of those industries. Locked out of those industries. It also leaves space for a lot of fake news to be circulated. Absolutely. This is how I feel about social media in general and the internet in general. Like, it's wonderful to democratize information, but we also have to be more critically thinking than ever because not all of that information is true. And negative information spreads faster, even and especially when it's false. And we all just have to be so aware of that. Yeah, at Mark Zuckerberg. Well, I think the funny thing about momfluencers as a cult is that it is the ultimate cult because you 
literally have to have a child to be a part of it. You yes. know, like it looks aspirational and then you're like, oh, that's so cute. I want to have one. And then you have one and then you're stuck with it for literally 18 years. Okay. Facts. And that also connects to really, really damaging cults because kids are often currency in really dangerous cults to keep women inside. At, at the Rights and Religions Forum conference that I was at the other week, I learned that it's often harder, but also more desperate in high control cultish religions like the Amish for women to leave expressly because they are the child bearers and the caretakers. And they're oftentimes coerced into having like 10 children, which is, first of all, so time consuming and keeps them from even like having Famously time. It takes nine months to bake <laughs> one up. <laughs> and to raise them takes yeah, even longer. Years. So, yeah, so they don't have time to even learn about the outside world, but also the kids become their whole life. So it psychologically makes it harder for them than the husbands yeah, to leave. I mean, there's nothing more, I don't know, on a personal level, but it looks like from Handmaid's Tale that there's nothing more <laughs> painful than like a mother being separated from her child. And so, like, how else would a cult keep? someone in by being like we control your child but therefore we control you i mean think about the fundamentalist church of the latter-day saints fundamentalist mormons a cultish community that it couldn't possibly be more controlling of women and reproduction and domesticity in a sense the general limitations that are placed on childbearing and reproduction in the united states combined with capitalism and momfluencer culture it's all cultish in the same way, just to varying degrees. Yeah. Something else that's also double culty about it is that not only are you having this kid to become a part of the group, then that kid is affected by the group for the rest of their life. There's so much exploitation of children in this momfluencer culture. There are specific examples of momfluencers exploiting their children for clout and money. Children who are used for social media content and are leading to profit are technically working children, but they aren't classified as such and therefore don't have the legal protections in the way that child actors do. So social media currently functions sort of like Hollywood pre-Coogan law. There was a quote from The Hollywood Reporter that was saying, at the moment, a child influencer's only form of legal legal recourse is to sue his or her parents at the age of 18. It's so sad these children work so much that then the parents kind of uh, move up in quality of life and then let's say they buy a new house and so then like the responsibility is on the kid to maintain that quality of life so they're really strapped in forever we should provide a few worst case scenarios yeah, to really demonstrate how destructive the cult of momfluencers can really be there was an instance where a youtube family family 05 was sentenced to five years of probation for child abuse after they inflicted cruel pranks on their children some of the incidents include telling one of their children to slap the other in the face and they oh filmed God. it they had videos showing them shoving and screaming at their kids and they were just doing it for the likes and the virality that was inflicting like pain and harm on those children and trauma the fucking internet there's just such a breakdown of empathy and you'd think that breakdown of empathy would only exist between followers and an influencer but now it's existing between parents and their own children are you supposed to keep child abuse private like a secret yeah that reminds me of when <laughs> i was on a road trip with my parents as a kid i think i was like 10 years old and it was like a seven hour drive and for fun my parents and my sister told me that i was adopted and i cried for like Classic. three hours straight <laughs> yeah, gonna, but are you all there is family? to show is a picture of me like one picture of me bawling my eyes out <laughs> which is like in hindsight funny at the time no. yeah making children cry is so funny that is the definition of humor yeah. I'm just kidding. so there is one more worst case scenario that we want to talk about there was this youtuber micah stoffer who adopted an autistic child from china to make content with him for years and then they placed him in a new family she had positioned herself as an advocate for international adoption. She even went on national news outlets to talk about it. She produced 27 videos about the adoption journey and plugged a fundraiser for it. And every person who donated $5 would unlock a different piece of a 1,000 piece puzzle, which would at the end be a photo of Huxley, the child that she would reveal to the world, and then returned him. Diabolical. As if it was like a puppy who like she couldn't train or something. 
Oh my God. And the cult of dog owners, because rehoming is like even more controversial than sending a human child back among dog lovers. It's problematic. <laughs> it is problematically even more controversial. I know. Yeah. I mean, this was, to be frank, an instance of a mom fluencer literally purchasing a child from all the way across the world exploiting him for content and then tossing him aside once they realized they didn't actually want to take care of these special needs anymore. Yeah, I mean, this just goes to show that like having kids, (laughs) if you didn't know already, having kids is a lifelong commitment. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And, And it's really something that you don't have to just be financially and physically ready for. It should be something that you want to do because I don't know. I guess why do people want to have kids? Well, I was about to say, like, the reasons to family plan, as they say, are so personal and so individual. And there is so much pressure on women in particular to procreate. Like, you've done life wrong. You've betrayed your purpose as a woman if you decide not to have children. And then, of course, like... I mean, a lot of kids were not quote unquote planned and still grow up happy and deserve to exist. And, you know, it's just it's such a fraught, loaded subject that our culture at large has really tried to control and police. And momfluencers are not helping that equation. They're not helping. So up next, we're going to talk to Sarah Peterson, a real life mother, because we (laughs) aren't. And so we wanted to talk to one. She's also a reporter on feminism and motherhood and has an amazing newsletter called In Pursuit of Clean Countertops and a book coming out called Momfluenced. Here's Sarah. Could you start by introducing yourself to our listeners and tell us how you started critiquing momfluencers in your work? I'm Sarah Peterson. I write about feminism and motherhood. And I started thinking about momfluencer culture when I had a toddler and a newborn at home. And I was frankly kind of bored, kind of existentially despairing about my life. And I started seeing all these beautiful mothers, their beautiful children and their beautiful lives. And mostly they were looking like they were having a great time as mothers and they made motherhood as an identity look really aspirational. And so I just started to try to explore the disconnect between what I was feeling engaged in the labor of mothering versus what they were presenting online, just trying to tease out that disconnect. And I have a book about it all coming out in April called Momfluenced. Inside the Maddening Picture Perfect World of Mommy Influencer Culture. What are the origins of momfluencer content and how was it developed from something potentially helpful into something cultish? So, the OG mommy bloggers, their bread and butter was sort of like snark and like real talk about motherhood. So, there was a lot of profanity, there was a lot of increased awareness about like postpartum depression, they would talk about their leaking nipples. And it was a really refreshing change of pace. It was very inclusive. It sort of brought people in to talk about the not so great sides of motherhood. That was like early 2000s. Um, and like right when Ray Dunn started, it's the, yes. imperfect, <laughs> it's the, it's the imperfect vibe of like women are people too. Yes, yes. Which was so <laughs> radical at the time. And the internet was severely imperfect at that time as well. So I'm sure those blogs, if you go onto the Wayback Machine and look at what they were in the early 2000s, I'm sure you would get a chuckle out of that. Yes. And yeah, it was totally not aesthetically driven the way it is now. That was another huge shift. And then once Instagram sort of became the more monetizable platform for these mommy bloggers, they all kind of moved over. And then the vibe really changed to a more aspirational imagery was everything versus before these women were personal essayists. And then they started partnering with big companies to sell Tide laundry detergent, $300 strollers, bamboo diapers. And then the era of SpawnCon was sort of born. What does SpawnCon mean? Sponsored content. Sponsored content. Oh, oh my gosh. I feel like I should have known that. We have a podcast. It is a totally disgusting term that makes me think of sperm. Yeah. I think of like... S-P-A-W-N. Exactly. (laughs) SpawnCon, which is, you know, by no coincidence, pretty appropriate for the topic (laughs) at hand. And I feel like that also makes sense that SpawnCon allowed for there to be a shift because you were having these organic platforms where people were genuinely giving advice and like telling people to use products that they found useful. And now that there's like so much sponsored content, you don't know what's real versus what's not real. How do you think religion has played a role in shaping the momfluencer landscape? 
Yeah. So, I mean, Mormonism is huge. Some of the OG mommy bloggers were Mormon. Many of the most financially lucrative momfluencers are still Mormon. And there's a long Why? history. So, okay. Yes. Mormons have a long history of recording life's milestones. So they're big on scrapbooking. They're big on diaries. They're big on recording everything. They're scrapbooking <laughs> for the Lord. Oh my God. For women who are raised in Mormon culture, their sphere is the domestic sphere. So it was only natural that these primarily stay-at-home mothers, you know, stuck at home with their kids all day, with beautiful houses and beautiful clothing, are going to turn to outward-facing expression. They were already journaling. They were already scrapbooking. So taking it onto blogs or an Instagram was just a way to make it public-facing and to maybe make money. Yeah. Sometimes I have this fantasy of just letting it all go and like <laughs> moving to Utah and <laughs> becoming a mom, you know? I don't know. I'm just kidding. I don't know what I'm on right now. <laughs> Isa has this thing where she wishes she could live her 20s an infinite number of times. Yeah, this is right. like an unpopular viewpoint. I could I, <laughs> I think never it should want... be more popular. <laughs> My understanding of mom fluencers connection to Mormonism is similar to Mormons connection to the multi-level marketing industry, which is that it's sort of implied in certain Mormon communities that mothers and wives aren't really supposed to work in the same way that husbands do and MLMs are sort of this loophole that gives them something to do and allows them to feel somewhat empowered. And momfluencing is the same thing. It's not the sort of job where you like put on your top hat and your coat and go to work. It's right. something you can do from home without ever having to leave your children. In fact, your children are a part of it. So it's like serving the Lord and the Mormon mission in that way. Totally. Yeah. Because you're making Mormonism look cool in many cases. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. <laughs> In scare quotes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you're, yeah, you're making it look aspirational. Again, in some cases, not all, but. Yeah. Oh my gosh. When I worked in the beauty industry, I remember there was this huge influx of Mormon beauty bloggers. Most of them did hair. They were amazing oh braiders. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amber Fillerup Clark is like yes. a huge, huge mom influencer. She has like a thriving hair extension business and like a hair care business. So. Yeah. Before she yeah. had kids, about she had braids. Influencers yeah. is that like they're so good at making things look aspirational that even though I don't aspire to do those things, they make you question whether you want to do them. I feel like sororities are really good at doing that. It's like the in-group mentality of like, we're a clique, we're together, we run this town. And then you're like, do I want to be a part of your crew? Because yeah. I, I just have FOMO. Totally. But it's like, you have to really check yourself in those moments and be like, mm, no, I don't. Yes. I, don't know what I, want. I think the insidiousness of momfluencers though is that they all seem a little bit competitive with each other, if not explicitly, then implicitly. And I think that's so very American where like your kids are supposed to be the quarterback and get into the Ivy League school. And it's this zero sum game that we discuss on the podcast all the time where like if your kid is the quarterback, then my kid can't be the quarterback. And if, you know, your your momfluencer Instagram account is super gorgeous, then mine can't be gorgeous. So I need to work so hard to make it look like... Yeah. Like yeah. I have the best life possible. Yeah. yeah. It also taps into so many other cults. I mean, there's the cult of prosperity. There's the cult of the nuclear family. There's the cult of whiteness. We talk about, you know, very GTFO level cults. They make you do something that is going to stay with you forever, branding or something like that. And like, what is the <laughs> ultimate branding if not a literal child, child. <laughs> that you have to birth? And then, ha like, take care of for 18 years. It's true. And sometimes you really do wonder because, I mean, it's proven that, like, new baby content and pregnancy content raises engagement and, you know, brings in more money. You really do wonder sometimes, like, are some of them having more babies for content purposes for or cloud. at least partially? Yeah. Oh, my God. I also yeah. just realized some synchronicity with the two meanings of the word brand. You know, in Nexium, they were literally branded on their skin. And on Instagram, you're branding yourself in a different sort of way. Yeah. <laughs> true. But they're both yeah. permanent and insidious. So <laughs> there seem to be different categories of momfluencers. Could you describe the main ones and what their content looks like? Totally. So, I mean, there's the McMansion momfluencer with her 
beachy blonde extensions, her all white everything, her <clears throat> kids in like preppy tailored outfits. She maybe does a lot of like charcuterie boards. Maybe her sponsored content is like Amazon or like the big box stores. So she's sort of like, I don't know, I guess a mainstream influencer. And then there's like <laughs> the trad wife influencers, which is a subset that I am just eternally fascinated with. But they're the ones like roaming in wildflower fields. They're mm. knitting their kids clothing and shades. Cottage like, core. Yes, exactly. They're moving Cottage to core. Hawaii. Totally. I mean, that's, or you could say that's like a tiny different subset. The like hippie Ooh. mom, the hippie yes. mom, the earthy, crunchy mom in Hawaii. But There's yeah. beach and there's mountains. Exactly. <laughs> you have to distinguish. <laughs> And then there's also like a ton of really cool radical moms that use their platforms for social justice and for raising awareness about all sorts of different issues. And often those accounts are not monetized, but they're still really making an impact in different ways. And you're like, and that's the category of mom influencer (laughs) I fall into. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like there's also, I mean, you might have touched on it a little bit, but there's that category of like, everything is so unorganized. They're like, oh, I'm running out of the door. It's the hot mess express mom. Like, yes. yes. Like talking about poop, talking about body stuff. And yeah, it's like, like, yeah, yeah. I'm feeding my baby on the train (laughs) with my boob out. Yes. So what? (laughs) And I'm like, well, I'm like, okay, nobody, nobody was calling you out for it. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. I know. Social media just encourages everyone to be so self-referential. It's like when you take an Instagram break for five days and literally nobody's (laughs) noticed. And then when you come back, you post and you're like, I'm back. (laughs) That's me. (laughs) That's everyone. That's me too. Uh, Sarah, I feel like that's also you. (laughs) Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. Everyone's like, did you miss me? And nobody missed us. And also we didn't. Miss yeah, Instagram. I didn't miss it. <laughs> yeah. like no longing in the equation. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, I'm sure there is still so much shaming for public breastfeeding, but the nature of Instagram does encourage all of us to market these vulnerable life moments as viral opportunities. And of course, not everyone is rewarded for sharing those equally. Yeah. Like if you have nice tits, gonna get a lot of likes. <laughs> If you Stop don't bragging about your tits again. I'm not bragging. I'm just, you know, you know that did sound like a brag and I'm sorry for that. They are nice. They are nice. <laughs> so what do you think are the cultiest things about mom influencers in both good and bad ways? I mean, the QAnon slash evangelical Christian slash MLM slash like free birthers. Mm -hmm. that category gets real culty and can become really dangerous and harmful because a lot of times these usually white, um, usually conventionally attractive mothers, they're not selling these problematic messages in a way that like, you know, a guy yelling on YouTube would. They're, They're making beautiful infographics and they're sort of resting upon their maternal authority to be like, you know, I'm I'm just a concerned mother. Like, these are just my thoughts. But they're yes. spreading misinformation in really widespread ways. Some of these people have like hundreds of thousands of followers. So yeah, yeah. I've heard this category of QAnon or described as pastel QAnon. Yes. It's more passive and polite and gender normative for women and palatable such that you would never think, oh, this looks or sounds like a cult, even though the rhetoric they're communicating can send you down a qanon rabbit hole. It's just nuts to me that having a child, which is something that people can just choose to do, and actually the government is like forcing some people to do, all of a sudden becomes a credit, mm. as if you got a master's degree or something. It's like Jim Jones had a family full of adopted children that he called the rainbow family as if that walking the walk of anti-racism so to speak was proof that he could not end up an abusive cult leader it's really it's insidious actually yeah. when you use yeah. that anecdotal personal quote unquote evidence as you know a, a credit of authority exactly like you were saying i also find the 
privilege aspect of it so sinister because we were talking about the sort of crunchy granola Hawaii mom, the free birther type who, you know, like rejects big pharma, which like, fair enough, big pharma is problematic, but they yeah. will not give birth in a hospital and they like will not ascribe to Western medicine. Some of them do have lip filler, though. Yeah, Meanwhile, some. like maternal death in childbirth is still actually such a serious problem in black communities. Right. And so for them to be like, no, don't give birth in a hospital is just so at best ignorant and at worst dangerous. Well, and a lot of times they co-opt these very real issues for marginalized communities. Like, you know, you were talking about the black mortality rate, like Black women going into childbirth have a very real reason to fear mainstream medicine and medical racism. And the privileged white lady, like, filming her, like, beautiful birth in the middle of, like, a, a rose bush or whatever. I can't think of, like, <laughs> the appropriately absurd image. And then also saying that anyone who has a C-section is doomed to have a weak attachment with her baby Oh my like, God. it's just really, it's, I mean, it's icky. It's icky. Yeah. Especially when talking about, yeah, like these things that a lot of times aren't up to choice, you know, like it's, it's just like most of the times a C-section is an emergency C-section and it's a very dangerous operation. It's, and then like on top of having that person go through the trauma of going through a C-section, you're also going to tell them that they aren't going to have a connection with their child. Yeah. It's so much about that really Rude. grinds my gears the toxic individualism yes. aspect to this idea that like if something is wrong in your life it's not systemic it's your fault and your fault alone you should have pulled yourself up by your bootstraps or your whatever fucking fancy boots don't slippers. even have straps anymore. like can we anymore. stop saying that <laughs> seriously we need a new metaphor for the footwear of today but also <laughs> this sort of <laughs> you know, bastardization of therapy speak that we've talked about on this podcast. Like, what do they know about attachment therapy? Like, you're not right. a psychotherapist, and yet you're speaking with authority on everything from childbirth to, you know, to psychiatry to Vaccine sunscreen. schedules. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It's madness. Yeah. What do you think are the most ridiculous, baseless claims that you've ever seen a momfluencer make? Oh my God. I mean, Amanda just mentioned the sunscreen one. There are so many anti-sunscreen momfluencers, like so, so, so many. We know sun damage causes skin cancer. So that's a big one. And all the anti-max, anti-vax stuff, they will proclaim their anti-vax, anti-mask sentiments and then run down all the things that will strengthen your immune system and prevent you from getting COVID and ultimately strengthen your child. You know, the herbal remedies. There's a lot of stuff about mold. Mothlancers are really big on mold. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and we do talk about extremes a lot on this podcast and little truths. Like they're not wrong that, you know, eating vegetables and drinking smoothies or doing things like that will strengthen your immune system. But it's the idea that it will prevent you from getting COVID that is – dangerous to spread. Also, all of that stuff is common knowledge. Like, right. we don't yeah. need a mom influencer yeah. to tell us that vegetables are good for you. Right. And, <laughs> and these are not accredited professionals or experts either. That's the other thing. They're just yeah. self-made experts. So It is so troubling to me that a lot of populist leaders, and I would consider mom momfluencers populist leaders, appeal to a certain slice of the population who feels disillusioned with and intimidated by and sort of radicalized to mistrust yep. scientists and whatever they don't understand is frightening to them. It's the same reason why a lot of people connected with Donald Trump, because they mistook his filterlessness and shamelessness and brazenness with honesty yeah. and relatability. But if you're like perfectly willing to claim authority on every topic, that's not a sign that people should follow you just because of confidence alone. It's a red flag. The most insidious thing about this to me is that mothers as like a demographic are really in need of answers and are really disenfranchised in so many ways. So like we have several reasons to distrust big pharma. We have several yeah. reasons to distrust uh, maternal health care. We have several reasons to distrust the fucking government and capitalism. Mm -hmm. So there are really 
very real issues that mothers are dealing with and momfluencers are swooping in and declaring themselves sort of saviors in any number of these ways. And it makes total sense that an exhausted mother working three jobs, like trying to feed her kids well and raise them well, is going to be looking for anybody that makes it easy and incorporates binary thinking, right? Yeah. Totally. And also, like, I'm just thinking about it from a perspective of, like, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. Let's say one night I'm I'm sick and I'm tired and I don't have anyone to take care of me, so I Google, like, why does my head hurt? And that's how moms feel, but about their children. Like, why is my baby crying? Why won't it stop crying? And they're in this panic Issa moment. calls all babies it. It's this charming little quirk. <laughs> I love that so much. It's very yeah, gender why is it crying? And... It's just, and then you're freaking out as a mom. And so of course you're going to go to like a place where you're going to get an immediate answer or you're going to get the answer that you want. Yeah, for free. Right. What do you think specifically about the vulnerabilities of mothers in 2022 make people susceptible to momfluencers' cultish influence? I mean, it's a nightmare. (laughs) It is a nightmare being a mother (laughs) in 2022. We are still... Uh, coping with PTSD from school closures um, and keeping the entire economy afloat on our unpaid labor. Um, And nothing is changing. Um, I shouldn't say nothing. There are so many incredible advocacy groups that are working tirelessly for systemic reform um, regarding maternal policy. But it's really slow moving. I mean, Roe v. fucking Wade. Like, it's just blow after blow after blow And it's really demoralizing and exhausting. And we are consistently burnt out. So, you know, it's, it's, so it's, it makes, I just have all the empathy in the world for a consumer of momfluencer culture who finds whatever momfluencer for whatever reason, and just really wants and needs that person to be there, be all end all. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned Roe v. Wade as a mother because it's like that a lot of people think immediately is it only affecting like young folks who don't want a child yet. But it's so important for people who already are mothers because adding another – just because you have a child doesn't mean you can just take care of more children. It's a financial burden. It's an emotional burden. It's a physical burden. And so – the fact that like there are mothers out there who still just like have to have another child because they like got off birth control and they thought they weren't going to get pregnant anymore. That happens so often. Oh, most of the people who have abortions already have kids. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so important for like, like building generational wealth or like building like a family that you can raise properly is important to have the right number of kids that you can deal with, Mm -hmm. you know, deal with. (laughs) I I love the ways that Issa organically talks about. (laughs) No, Issa is right. It is a deal with situation. I also, how you mentioned like the, the, the PTSD of the pandemic, postpartum depression is like a version of depression, but I feel like it's like post pandemic depression. Of course you love your child, but if you had to deal with it 24 seven, I can't even fully put myself in your shoes, but A lot of people aren't even talking about that of like re-loving your child again after you had to deal with it for two years. Yeah, it was, I mean, all of my mom friends and I will still text each other like our virtual learning schedules like taped on the fridge or whatever and like just all the shiver and fear, like death emojis. It's, it was bad. It was bad. You know, I, what's occurring to me is that I, I, I know that like, motherhood has always been traumatic and difficult in many ways it's better the best now than it has ever been in terms of you know surviving childbirth and having you know access to resources and things and yet it is still so hard and still so imperfect and i would almost argue that the cultish influence of momfluencers is able to thrive so much because of the sense of optimism that has emerged from, you know, it it kind of is possible to like, quote unquote, have it all, not for everybody, but like, we're getting there. And, you know, to your point, progress is happening really slowly. And momfluencers make it seem like it can happen overnight, it can happen to you. Mm -hmm. And that aspiration is really, you know, feeding into the larger cult of of momfluencers in general. Also, I just feel like we're coming from a long period of 
birthing being a choice. And so I feel like that was the rise of the early 2000s of like all these moms of being like, oh, I did choose to do this. So I am happy to be here. And now we're in this era of going back to like, it might not have been a choice, even if I do have the resources at hand. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think it's possible to participate in the cult of monfluencers in a net positive way? Ooh, net positive. (laughs) Um, God, because the cult of Instagram is implicated in participating in the cult of momfluencers, I cannot say net positive. No. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I mean, I think if Instagram was less culty and social media was less culty, maybe. But because all these things are deliberately designed to be addictive and to suck away like our wild and beautiful lives. I don't think it can be that positive. I think you could participate thoughtfully and gain positive things from it, but I think you always have to kind of be checking yourself and, you know, having critical conversations with yourself. Mm -hmm. I long for the days that Instagram will go back to chronological posting. I'm like, that would change our lives. Mm. (laughs) If if it didn't go away, but if the algorithm was a little less scary. If the feed was just chronological. Anyway, that's what I dream about at night (laughs) since I don't have kids. Dream big. (laughs) (laughs) Who are some influencers you like and who are some people that we should definitely be wary of? Oh, man. Some that are definitely watch your back are Rose Uncharted. Her feet is beautiful. She has dabbled in Trumpism, in QAnon stuff, in anti-vax, anti-mask, all the things, and also sells like beautiful hand-dyed tea towels. She's so she's. I'm a one. sucker for all this. Is this whole cottage core aesthetic? Like I, know. I eat that shit. Up. I know. I really do. <laughs> Another one who I just have a complicated relationship with, who I talk about a lot in my book, is Ballerina Farm. Do you guys know her? Oh, but I'm looking. No, right Ballerina now. Farm. Oh man. I mean, yeah. ballerina. Ballet is a cult of its own ballerina. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, oh we're going to do that in the future, a cult of ballet. Yeah. she. Okay, 1.7 yeah. million followers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's big. She's this, like, rancher. She's Mormon. She has seven kids. She's married to one of the heirs of Jet Blue, but that's not part of their branding because it wouldn't go with, like, the down-home aesthetic. The quaintness. Yeah. Right. Yeah, obviously, yeah. But she's just really selling uh, the nuclear family ideal and, mm. like, rural um, Eden type of stuff. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I'm watching a video of hers right now, and she's dressed like a 1800s <laughs> wife. Like, I mean, she's wearing, like, an apron with, like, a flowery yeah. – what are those? Like, a colonial outfit. She, well, okay. she sells she sells the aprons, so you can buy one yourself, Oh, Isa. my God. That oh. glorification of a time that was objectively hell for right. women everywhere is right. just something I cannot and get And for behind. many other people, too. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my God. For literally everyone ex- – well – even for the most privileged people because everyone was dying right and left of fucking tuberculosis. <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, it, was, it was bad for everyone. <laughs> I feel like the ballerina one, if she did like a week-long camp for adults, for her to be like their adult mommy, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. <laughs> I would go to the camp, put my phone away and be like, cook for me, clean for me, mm-hmm. you know, but that's a cult. That's, she shouldn't do that. <laughs> no, um, I, but, but I always say this. I feel like that would be a healthier mode of engagement than yeah. the Instagram shit. That's like, yeah. True. Cause it, it, it would be direct and explicit. It wouldn't be. Says Amanda as she plans her. <laughs> Literally <laughs> though, retreats. I'm trying. I, I am hosting a retreat next year for oh. aspiring writers. Oh, cool. <laughs> One that I love, Casey Davis, her handle is at Struggle Care. Her platform is just all about how like care work and domestic work is a part of adult life, but creating, for example, like a beautiful bespoke laundry room is a hobby and is like a gendered thing that women are taught to take on as something that they should quote unquote naturally do. Mm-hmm. 
You know, I was right. chatting with a medieval historian, uh, oh. one of the sources for the book that I'm currently writing, who was talking about how one of the myths of the Middle Ages was that women didn't work um, and that like women were just like cooped up in their little peasant cottages. But actually women in the Middle Ages worked a great deal just as much as men. That's one of the reasons men wanted to get married so their wives could help them with the work. And it wasn't until the Protestant Reformation and then the Enlightenment when people started attributing pushing women into the home as like science they were like the domestic sphere is naturally what women are made for this is you know this is empirical here the claim that women have never worked is historically (laughs) just inaccurate because every human person comes out of a vagina you know (laughs) what I mean so like we have literally worked so hard (laughs) that we have created a society I mean it's called labor it's called labor Labor. yeah (laughs) I love that darn chat. She does a ton on egalitarian partnerships within the home. And she's hilarious. She's huge on TikTok too. You know, when people will like see a dad changing a diaper and be like, oh my God, he's such a great dad. Yeah. And for yeah. doing the bare min. Yes, yes. So she just excoriates that bullshit and it's love that. delightful. The NB Mama is queer non binary. They've got some great posts. Just sort of, going through certain experiences that have been coded feminine Mm -hmm. and experiencing sort of the gendered complication of that. Okay, one more I want to shout out, sitting underscore pretty. Her name is Rebecca. She's an author and she writes about disabled motherhood and is great for representation, but she's also just a stunning, stunning, stunning writer and is able to put the indescribable parts of motherhood into words in a way that sort of floors me every time. So I adore her as well. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much for answering our questions and engaging in this tete-a-tete. Now we would like to play a game. (laughs) We're going to play a game of what's called here Momfluencer edition. We're going to give you two Momfluencer scenarios and you're going to tell us what's called here. Cool. So scenario number one, a YouTube momfluencer or an Instagram momfluencer? I'm going Instagram momfluencer. I think the YouTube momfluencers can be a little more inclusive. They can be a little more fun sometimes. You can get to know them a little better on YouTube as well. It's less filtered yeah. comparatively. Yeah. Okay. Which is cultier, momfluencer edition, momfluencers who sell MLM products or momfluencers who sell their own DIY wellness workshops? Oh, this one's so hard. Um, (laughs) I mean, I'm going to say the DIY workshops because I legit just saw like an anti-feminism (gasps) pro-femininity workshop. What? Talked by one of these mom influencers. So I'm going to say, basically, I just think if it's a DIY workshop, there's just no holds bars. So I'm going to go with that. It can be like so fringe because a mainstream MLM would not want to identify as anti-feminist for fear of the fact that people would not sign up. Right. (laughs) Exactly. Okay. Which is cultier? Mormon momfluencers or evangelical momfluencers? This one is tough too, but I'm going to go evangelical. Oh, pot twist. (laughs) I just. I don't see overtly incendiary stuff from the Mormons as much as I do for the evangelicals. Evangelicals are so much more politically powerful in this country. I mean, George W. Bush was an evangelical Christian. We've never had a Mormon in the White House. Right. Well, no. Oh, no. He didn't. Oh, my God. Yeah, I was going to say Mitt Romney, but he was never president. (laughs) Oh, I forgot he was a Mormon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, evangelicals have their fingers in so many different mainstream American pies. I mean, the cult of the family who puts on the national prayer breakfast every year. I could I mean, Hollywood is like so obsessed with making Mormon docuseries right now. I'm like, where are the evangelicals, dude? Yeah. It's harder to make that content because since they have their hand in so many pies, you know, they prevent it from happening. Yeah. Um, can I shout out a book I just read about evangelical stuff? Please. It was yeah. r- incredible. Um, Jana Cadleck's Heretic. It comes out in like oh, a yes. week. Oh my God. Yes, so, Heretic. So, so good. And I learned so much about evangelicalism from it. So I highly recommend. 
Yeah, she's an ex-evangelical. She's a queer writer. She's amazing. I did an event with her for Cultish. Yeah. Okay, two more. Which is cultier? Posting photos and identifying details about your kids without their consent, otherwise known as sharenting, or raising your white kids on stolen land and claiming indigenous practices as your own? Oh, these are hard. I think I'm going with the second one. Because arguably you could do the first one, quote unquote, responsibly. Like if you put the money in a trust for the kids later. <laughs> I'm creating all these loopholes. <laughs> right. But yeah. I, I'm going to go with the second one, I think. Fair. Yeah. I feel like that one has like more societal repercussions, whereas the first one is more individual, individual. repercussions. Right. right. Facts. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Last one. Which is cultier, momfluencers who post photos of their family, but they only facetune themselves, or momfluencers who post photos of their family and also facetune their children? <laughs> this, one, this one feels impossible. Okay, I'm going with the facetuned kids, because that's, yeah. so yeah. oh that's just creepy. That's just creepy. It's so creepy. I mean, objectively, like, seeing a facetuned child yeah. is scary. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I will say this, though. A friend of mine showed me a photo of a friend of hers who'd just given birth, and it was one of those, like, I've just given birth right. photos in, like, the hospital bed, and she had facetuned the living shit out of herself, and it was so <laughs> obvious because the baby looked like a little goblin. <laughs> As all babies do. Yeah, I don't get the goblin picture. I actually, like, will die on this cross. I don't think newborns should be posted. <laughs> no. They uh... need to bake, you know? Like, let them let them sit rest. out of the oven. Yeah, they need to Let rest. them cool. Yes. <laughs> and then in a week or two, you can post the baby. I know. She's got, like, poreless skin, and there's still placenta oh on the God. fucking baby. <laughs> oh, my God. So rude. It is. Yeah. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion of the cult of momfluencers. If folks want to keep up with you and your cult, where can they do that? Thank you for having me. I guess the cultiest place you can find me is my newsletter, which is called <laughs> <laughs> In Pursuit of Clean Countertops. And it's all things momfluencer and all things like cult of the ideal mother. And I'm on Instagram and Twitter at S. Louise Peterson with an E. And my, oh, and my book, my book. Yes, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and my book comes out in April, and that's called Mom Fluenced Inside the Maddening Picture Perfect World of Mommy Influencer Culture. So, Amanda, Mom Fluencers, what do you think? Do you think that they're a live your life, a watch your back, or a get the fuck out level cult? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm really, this is a pregnant pause, so to speak, because ah. uh, I'm really torn here. I mean, Sarah did tell us that there's like no truly healthy way to engage with momfluencer content, which leads me to believe it's teetering up against to get the fuck out. But I think ultimately it is a watch your back. Yeah, I would 100% agree. It's a watch your back because it's like there's no safe way to engage with the content but as long as you're watching your back yeah. as long as you're aware of the games that it plays then it can be like a fun outlet for mothers a fun outlet and and also a nourishing outlet at the end of the day it's like what's the alternative do we just want mothers not to seek community online like yeah. do we want them to be as alone as they once were I don't think that's reasonable it's just about finding certain mom influencers who are not trying to push an agenda who are not trying to yeah. isolate you from your in-person support systems it makes me think about how moms really should get into like watching sports more and this is <laughs> all goes back to basketball because oh my like, god maybe moms could have like an excuse of being like oh we're gonna go watch the game the way that dads do and they can have like an outlet to discuss well, their problems that's like not serious you know it's just a <laughs> game go watch a game I don't think it has to be sports because that yeah. will never be me but I, I do think that variegating and diversifying your sites of community is really important. Like, sure, you can have a couple momfluencers that you follow on Instagram. Take it all with a damn grain of salt as much as you possibly can. Cults are unavoidable. That's the whole idea behind our podcast. It's just about being a follower of the right ones. But I love that, like, 
basketball is the like dumb activity that you won't stop talking about and line dancing is my new equivalent (laughs) they're both exciting i mean basketball is obviously better but no just kidding (laughs) oh my god we never even got to talk about gender reveals (laughs) or Uh. sex reveals or whatever that's like a whole topic for another day like the cult of gender and sex reveals they're so cringy they're so dangerous they've literally caused wildfires so wildfires gender trauma like there are physical and psychological repercussions Percussions to gender reveals. Yeah. Watch your Sick. back, babies, and for your babies. <laughs> babies and moms. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, that is our show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back with a new cult next week. But in the meantime, stay culty. But not too culty. Sounds Like a Cult is created, hosted, and produced by Issa Medina and Amanda Montel. Our research and social media assistant is Noemi Griffin. Our theme music is by Casey Cole. This episode was mixed by Adam Haar. Isa here. You can follow me on Instagram at Isa Medina, I-S-A-A-M-E-D-I-N-A-A to check out tickets to all my live shows and tell me where I can perform. And Amanda here. I'm on Instagram at Amanda underscore Montel. And feel free to check out my books, Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism, and Word Slut, A Feminist Guide to Taking Back the English Language. We also have a Patreon, and we would really appreciate your support there at patreon.com slash sounds like a cult. And if you like our show, feel free to leave us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And if you don't like our show, rate other podcasts the way you'd rate us. My whole thing about wanting to have kids is like, I just want to have one little gay son. Yeah. I know you can't control it. He's not gay. He's not in the family. No, he'll be disowned. I'm excited for it. I mean, if you have kids, then I don't have to have kids. I don't know. Because that's how that works. No, but in cults, everyone raises everyone's kids. And sounds like a cult is a cult at this point. Yeah.